Hi, and welcome to another episode of The Vixen Voice. This week we're doing something a little fun. We're calling this one Girl Talk. Um, I recently took a trip to Europe. I was kind of experimenting for three weeks. I went to Vienna for a couple of days, and then I traveled throughout Spain. And what I wanted to do was experiment with being in Europe, living the European lifestyle, you know, it's seven hours ahead. So I woke up well before the US and just see like how well it worked living over there, traveling and still doing my work at the Vixen Gathering. So instead of, I kind of wanted to share a couple of travel tips, things that happen, what I discovered. And I thought what would be a lot more fun than me just chatting with you and sharing, I invited my two best friends on. So total disclaimer, they are gonna interview me. I am in the hot seat today. So we have Shelly and Sarah. I know you've seen them on episodes before. But Shelly is the founder of Milestone DMC, a leadership and retained search firm. Um, and Sarah is the founder of Sarah in the City Events. And she does events all over. In fact, she did five events in five states just the last month. So yes, exactly. We are all insane. Um, and Sarah has two small children. So definitely, if you're in that case, check out her solo episode. She has lots of great tips about how to manage it. And as always, you can go to vixengathering.com slash podcast and get all of these lovely ladies information um, in case you fall in love with them the way I do and you want to work further with them or hear more for them. Also, this episode will be fully broadcast on YouTube. So go find us on YouTube if you're listening and you want to check us out. So today we're going to have a little bit of fun. I have no idea what these ladies are going to ask me about my trip. I heard a rumor that my team sent them questions to ask too, so I don't know if they're slipping those in or not. So uh, we're gonna roll. I think Sarah, you're up first. You told me you had a burning question for me. Oh, well, as far as a burning question, when I found <laughs> out that you were going to travel to Europe for three weeks, um, yeah. it stressed me out to think about how you were gonna manage that and all of your work. So what are your tips for doing that and how did you manage it? I love it. So I'll tell you the one lesson I learned. So I was in Vienna for four days. I landed Tuesday through Friday, flew to Barcelona that Saturday. Um, I had kind of earmarked Vienna as kind of free days, which was vacation. I had planned to work Wednesday and Friday, take Tuesday and Thursday off. So the days off went great. I mean, I woke up early so I could get some stuff done. Um, the days I tried to work, um, because it was light work was challenging. And here's why. Europe does not operate the same as the US, right? So I went to lunch with a friend. I had a meeting afterward in Vienna. I called a, an Uber. Ubers, taxis aren't as fast and reliable, even though I was in Vienna, which is an exceptionally run city. Um, you know, and so I had to get on my Zoom from the taxi and literally the guy was like, let's just reschedule this, right? So there were definitely some hiccups. You have to allow um, more time. I think in your normal life, you're very good at timing things to get on. The next week when I was in Spain, it was a little bit easier because I kind of planned to be out in the morning and then I had designated time to be in my hotel or apartment that I rented. Um, and so that was easier. The second thing I found out was I overbooked myself logistically because when I went to Spain, I was in Barcelona for two days and then I drove to Valencia for a day met a friend for breakfast in Alicante, which was amazing, and then drove to Cartagena for a day, and then drove to Estepona for a day. Um, and I was working those afternoons. So as you know, if you've traveled in Europe, I rented a car. Like for example, Cartagena is a very small, older city. I had to park outside the city, get my backpack on with my, with my laptop, and hike 15 minutes up a hill to my hotel to get on my Zoom in time. So I think you have to have a sense of adventure um, and you definitely have to have a 
this sense of flexibility and you know hopping on zoom calls with like sunglasses on my head no makeup hair pulled back which you guys know I never show up like that right <laughs> so but I mean people were really cool about it and wanted to hear about my travels and really great so um, it was definitely an experience once I got to the place where I had the apartment it was much easier so if I did it again I think I'd do a week somewhere a week somewhere and a week somewhere and not be trying to travel during the week while I was also trying to work that was the hard part okay well I don't know if it's something I'll try to do in the near future but I'm glad <laughs> it worked out for you <laughs> and it seems to align with your core values which are adventure so that's yeah. one of them is adventure so good yeah I mean it kind of reminded me you know I studied in London when I was 21 yeah, I think I was 21. And I remember getting the Brit Rail Pass and you know, you land in towns and you don't know what the heck's going on. I mean, I, I definitely had some adventures like that at 47, um, which are different at 47 than 21 when you don't have responsibility. But I don't know, it was kind of fun and it showed, it stretched me outside of my comfort zone. And since I've gotten home, I found, you know how at the end of the day you've done I did 13 hours of Zoom on Tuesday, right? I was way over scheduled. And at the end of that day, normally you'd be like, screw it, I'm ordering Uber Eats and like, I'm not working out. And, you know, instead I cooked dinner. And I don't think before this trip I would have done that because I got used to being a little uncomfortable, which I think is good. I'd like to know what was your greatest adventure and in what city did that adventure happen? Uh, honestly, I don't know that I had great adventures outside of logistics. Um, <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you the best. Oh, actually, this was interesting. I can tell you the best meal I had. This wasn't an adventure, but I was in Valencia. I got there. I had two hours to get lunch, which is great because, you know, in Spain, they take forever to serve you, have lunch like it's an ordeal. So I was like, OK, I have time to eat before a Zoom start. So I went into the center town. It was a national holiday. There were people everywhere. So trying to find definitely if you're traveling, pay attention to when there are national holidays, because remember, less things are going to be open and people are everywhere. Right. Mm. So you want to know the holidays where you're traveling, because um, that happened to me twice in Spain and, and kind of messed up my schedule. Right. Just because I was so tight trying to work. If I were on vacation, it would have been fun. Um, so I so I filmed this like cute little I went where it was recommended and they laughed at me because I didn't have a reservation even though they didn't have a darn person sitting at a table. So that's very different than the U.S. The U.S. is like, yeah, come on, just eat quickly and we'll flip the table, right? So they laughed at me. So I went to the next restaurant and um, I found this cute little restaurant and I wanted to sit outside. And the lady goes, how many? And I was like, one. No, no one outside. Like, basically, they wouldn't let me sit outside because I was by myself. So, I mean, sometimes, I guess if I were in go mode, I probably would have been like, okay, fine, I'll find another restaurant. So, like, luckily I didn't. I was like, okay, can I sit inside? It was the best meal I had in all of Spain. So, one, I'm glad I stayed. Then number two, because it was a national holiday, I looked outside and the outside was filled with smoke because they had all these fireworks going off. So like, it turned out to be a blessing that I just kind of stayed there and ate inside. It was such a good meal and I would have hated it if, it if I were outside. So, you know, one, it was interesting just to see how I was treated being like a female traveling alone or a solo person trying to eat, which they thought was weird. It, you know, it's not like the US where you can go sit at the bar. Um, and then, and then too, it was interesting that I just stuck to my guns and stayed. Um, so I think when you're traveling, you know, flexibility is so key. Yeah. I'm remembering a trip long ago to London when I was in my twenties and there was a wait yeah. for the restaurant and these two men came up to my friend and I, and they were like, Hey, are you guys on this list? And we said, yes. And they said, well, we'll buy your dinner if you let us come in with you. And it wasn't, yeah. there wasn't anything weird happening. They really just wanted to eat. They were hungry. I'm sure they had an expense account and it was a really wonderful thing. So I think like you're explaining flexibility and being open-minded <clears throat> letting the adventure take you where it goes is part of the fun. Yeah, it was. And I mean, honestly, I didn't eat a meal alone except for that one in Valencia 
until I got way down south in Estepona because, well, in V and I had a couple of friends. So I had meals with friends and then um, I just met people and I got invited to stuff. Um, but even in Spain, I landed in Barcelona. I was like, okay, I want to go to the Sagrita Familia, which I'm probably butchering the name. And I want to find somewhere to sit down, have a glass of cava, have lunch, and just look at this. Because that's like one of my favorite things to do. I remember sitting in Rome at the Parthenon, just going, it's so cool that I'm having an aperitivo and there's the Parthenon, right? So I did that. And I sat down and this guy goes, honey, you're going to burn up. That sun's hot. Because it was the only table in the sun. And I was like, oh, I lived in Houston, Texas for 13 years. This is nothing. And like they were laughing. And we got to talking and there were this amazing couple from Kansas City. Like one of them is head of the, is the composer of the orchestra there. And the other one had like a cooking show on TV and they were there for a cruise. And we met up the next day to have drinks. Um, and then that night I met up with my friend Emma, who you, you all know, who lives in the UK and was in Spain too. Um, and she's been on the show. And then she and I were out having tapas and a glass of wine and met a couple from a, another British couple who were like, oh, we know where to take you for dinner. So like, I don't know, it was really cool just to like having mutual travelers just wanting to chat and visit. And I mean, I think I made like 11 friends in the first nine days. It was really crazy. Yeah. I think it's amazing. beautiful. Yeah, I think it's beautiful that you stay open because sometimes we in the U.S. are a little more closed off. And I think that it's great that you are open to have these experiences of meeting new people and kind of just seeing where that takes you. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I mean, it's fun. And, you know, I think you're right in the U.S. because... As you know, one thing I love about Nashville is everyone's so friendly here. So I will go sit at a bar and eat by myself. And often people talk to you, but not always, right? Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. is definitely different, which cracks me up. Because if you're in an airport and you sit at a bar, the person next to you always starts talking to you. So, like, why would it be the same just in a normal restaurant? But there's something about travel where people just open up. Speaking of opening up. Did you meet any fun men while you were traveling around? <laughs> well, I will tell you this. The Spanish men are exceptionally good looking, especially in southern Spain, but they all had small Ooh. children tied to them. It's a very family oriented, like, you know, it seems like, I don't know. I know when I lived in Italy, a lot of my friends weren't married, but they were coupled up for life. So I don't know if these couples were married per se, but definitely I want to say like married life and family seems to be very alive and well in Spain. And it was actually really beautiful to see. I mean, still at nine, 10 o'clock, the kids are running around, they're out to dinner. Like it was, it was really fun. And it seemed to be a very safe environment for kids to be out and about in. So I liked it. It reminded me, Sarah, do you remember that time we had Henry with us and we were like at Toulouse and Houston like the band was playing and he was just running around having the best time ever um I mean that's kind of not normal in the U.S. right so that was cool to see but uh no it's interesting because right now I am exceptionally single no prospects no ex-boyfriends hanging around like it's kind of cool and I'm kind of excited about it so I can't wait to see who comes into my life next while you were sitting and chatting with new people, did you experience any new drinks? No, I tend to stick to what I know. <laughs> so I'm not, you know, you all know me. I don't really like sweet things. Um, so I, I will tell you, I think I had a glass of wine almost every day for three weeks, even the days I was working. Um, their wine's different. It's lower in sugar. You know, it doesn't have the sulfites. Like, I mean, it's just different. It doesn't affect you the same way. So it very much is like something you can have with, with dinner or lunch even. Um, so yeah, in Spain, I drink a lot of cava because I like cava. So I'd have that at lunch and I'd have red wine or vino tinto at dinner. Um, I'm trying to think when I was in Vienna, I did try Austrian wine. I wanted to try a typical aperitivo, but I didn't get like good guidance on it. So no, I never really tried that anywhere. Yeah. Do you have any other fun cultural differences stories? You mentioned that um, no one outside, but did you have any other <laughs> snafus or language barriers or things that happened that were a bit silly? 
Yeah, that could have been that little restaurant. Um, trying to think. I feel like... So, I did notice the further down south I got. Like, I would say when I was in Cartagena and Estepona, which Estepona is, like, to the other side of Malaga. So, it's in between there and um, Gibraltar. I mean... It was definitely a lot less, like, people were more closed. I don't know if that's the right word, but, you know, it was kind of like they weren't as open to talk to outsiders, even though Estepona is a very touristy city. It wasn't tourist time. And so while, you know, I will tell you the wait stuff everywhere was phenomenal. Like, I mean, you know, in the U.S., we used to be top in customer service. I think we have fallen in that. Um because I will tell you, you know, I know that tourism is a huge part of the European economy and they definitely take care of you when you're dining. It's a nice experience, everything. Um, but I found people less likely, like, you know, that happened in Barcelona. People weren't sitting next to me that just started talking to me. Um, so that definitely happened in Barcelona, Valencia. I mean, every time I sat down, someone was chatting with me. So um, that was a little closer. The other thing is, as you all know, I rented a car. So this is a practical tip. I never get the insurance when I rent a car in the US because my personal auto insurance covers it. Well, over there, I was like, oh my gosh, this car is so cheap. It was like 700 euros for 12 days, right? Which as you know, like three days in the US cost you like a thousand bucks right now. Well, I get there and I find out, oh, but I have to buy insurance because otherwise I'm liable for any damage. So my U.S. insurance is not good there. So that was another $700. <laughs> so it literally doubled the cost. And I mean, you're there. What are you going to do? But I will tell you, I was very grateful to have the insurance because things are different there than here. So uh, I would definitely recommend <laughs> take the insurance if you rent a car, but be prepared for that. You mentioned um, recognizing the holidays when you travel. Did you experience, mm -hmm. because you encountered a couple of different holidays, did you experience any unique traditions? Mm, I don't know. There were just a lot of people everywhere. They were definitely, <laughs> in uh, Valencia, they were having a reenactment of something. There was a parade, and I felt like it was a reenactment. It might have been Independence Day or something. Um, and then they had the fireworks everywhere. And it, it was really cute to see how everyone was gathered and watching, right? Like, everyone was definitely into it. So... No, unfortunately, I didn't get to witness anything super cool. Hmm. Hmm. Are you one that brings back souvenirs? Uh, the only souvenir I brought back was a Fendi wallet. Oh. Bright pink. I, I thought you might have brought a man back in your luggage. <laughs> no, I told you I'm completely single right now. <laughs> didn't happen. Hey, I didn't say you wanted a relationship. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, actually what happened was I had, um, on my computer, I had my cord messed up. Um, so I had the converter for the cord, but I had, I have Macs and my Mac, something happened. I lost my Mac charger. So I had bought a non Mac charger and they tend to come apart in my experience. So that happened to me on a Sunday and I had meetings on Monday. So I was like, oh my gosh. I, and I was in Estepona there then, which is like a sleepy little town. Everything's closed on Sunday. So, you know, I kind of looked and there was like a Mac store, a town over. And I went and it turns out, I forgot, Porta Bana or Bana, I think it was. Anyway, apparently it's like the luxury place everyone goes to. So I went there to buy a Mac cord, which I got, and the guy was super helpful. And then I walked out and I'm like, oh, there's Fendi and Valentino and this and that. So I couldn't resist. I was like, let me just pop in. Um, so that was interesting that they were open on Sunday. But this particular town like catered to the international luxury market. And that's why. Um, and they were super helpful. So yeah, I bought this bright pink Fendi wallet that also has mm. a chain so I can wear it. So I'm super excited. And it felt cheaper than the U.S. I haven't looked it up to see the cost here, but it felt cheaper. Hmm. Might want to hang on to that feeling. I suspect it's just a feeling. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I tell you what, um, with the cost of everything here now, I know we get paid better in the U.S., but it was exceptionally cheaper being in Europe. Like, I really felt if I moved to Europe, I would live on like 25% of what I live on in the U.S. currently, paying rent, et cetera. Yeah. If you were to create another work from Europe trip in the future, what would you do differently? Well, I already have it planned. (laughs) We'll see come March what I want to do. But, you know, my lease is up here in Nashville. I'm leasing to see if I want to stay and buy. And the real estate market's insane right now. Um, So my lease is up in March. And I did not get to see Madrid. Um, As you guys know, I had a family emergency. So I had to, like, get home quickly. Um, But Madrid seemed like a really amazing city. And, you know, I had gotten an apartment, like, in a beach town in southern Spain, which is what I wanted to check out, like if I wanted to be on the Mediterranean for some time, um, because I have property on the Caribbean. So I thought, oh, I'll just bop from the Caribbean to the Mediterranean. That would be a cool digital nomad life, right? Um, I, I feel I would be bored there. The cities were much more interesting to me, and you can go to small towns from the cities. So If I do this again, I thought come March when my lease is up, if I don't know, you know, if I'm staying, going, buying a house, et cetera, I thought it'd be fun. I already planned that I would go to Madrid for the month of March. So I would stay a whole month and like rent an apartment. And then I would take off Friday, Saturday, Sunday to travel. Um, April, I would go to Paris. May, I would go to Milan, and June, I would go to London. So I think I would get, like, a place to root for the full month and just, like, travel out from there. Yeah. Wow. When you were traveling, were there any landmarks that left you in awe? I know you sent me a few pictures, and I was just like, oh, wow, how beautiful. But were there any that left you in awe? Actually, what surprised me and I loved most was driving in Spain. So I drove from Barcelona to Valencia to Alicante to Cartagena to Estepona. So you can pull up a map. So along the Mediterranean, their highways in a bit. Um, First of all, their highways were phenomenally nice. Like I was amazed at how good the road system was. And second of all, I didn't understand the topography of Spain and there were everywhere I went, there were mountains to this side, Mediterranean to this. And so like just driving, unfortunately I was driving and I was by myself, so I couldn't capture videos and pictures. Um, But yeah, it felt so free. Like each day I had like a two and a half to four hour drive that I was driving and um, it was, exceptionally beautiful just the landscape was so beautiful did you listen to any music or local radio or what did you do while you were driving oh yeah i found local music channels so and listen i was trying to learn some spanish because i don't know any spanish it's crazy because i speak italian i could understand them but the words are different enough that i like did not even have basics of Spanish. So honestly, that's what I would do differently. I would have at least got the basics down before going, because even though a lot of people speak English in places, I I definitely ran into people that didn't speak any, you know, you find a way to communicate, but I also feel it's rude not to try to speak their language. So I, I would have felt better had I had some more basics under my belt. I mean, you know, how to say hello, goodbye, you know, I knew how to say thank you and you're welcome. But um, I know in Italy, for example, you say different things at different parts of the day because I know Italian. So like just knowing the niceties, you know, I was a little disappointed in myself that I didn't have time or do that ahead of time. So I think I would have gotten the basics down. And then I think you need to have the basics of food down just because I'm a foodie. Mm-hmm. So I want to order good food and wine, right? So I remember um, Borders, the bookstore, used to have those language maps you could get. And it would be like the country you're going to, like all the basics. So I, I think something like that or taking like beginner lessons for a month before going would be smart. Mm. Mm. Via audio. I have another question. Um, Since you did go to Europe for three weeks and you're a woman who has a unique style, are there any tips for packing? What did you do? How many bags did you take since you were traveling alone and you were also moving a lot? Uh, How did you kind of strategize that? 
So I have a strict rule in Europe, one suitcase. Um, in fact, when I took my niece Joplin there when she was 16, I was like, you only get one suitcase. And she was like, are you kidding me? Well, I need one for my shoes. And I was like, we're taking trains and I am not helping you with your luggage. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really strict about one suitcase. So I did bring a large suitcase because I was working and as you'll know, I do healing. So I had some healing instruments with me. So it was a large suitcase. Whereas I used to travel to Europe for two weeks with like a medium sized suitcase if it's just closed. So great question. Um, so I brought a pair of flip flops, a pair of boots, because unfortunately it was going to be a little chilly at night in Vienna. So I went in comfortable. I honestly would have ditched the boots and just worn my black tennis shoes. So I did bring my black tennis shoes. So they kind of blended better with things. Um, and then I did bring a pair of like chunky heeled gold heels that I have that are fairly comfortable. I did not wear them once. So like, I mean, I actually could have gotten away just with flip flops and tennis shoes, to be honest. Um, and you know, cause you're traveling around. I mean, it's different if you're going there and you're going to events or going to something, but you really need less than you think of. And then I thought I was going to get to do laundry. So I did pack seven workout outfits because I knew I wanted to work out every day. And it was going to be seven days till I got somewhere to do luggage and seven pairs of socks. I'm sorry to do laundry. Um, I did not wear my workout outfits at all because I walk so much during the day. I averaged five miles a day the first week there, just like in my normal, you know, clothes. I mean, when I say normal, you know, Sarah, I have the comfy athleta pants that look like leather pants, but they're really yoga pants. So like that type of thing. And then, you know, I had one sweater with me. Um, I have a puffy jacket that rolls up. It's from Tumi. It's awesome into a neck pillow. So I always take that in a raincoat with me. Um, so you really can stretch things, but I did not, I did not get to do laundry like I thought. So I was stretched a little thin on clothes at the end, but I made it work. Nice. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and one other tip only because if you're concerned about this, like I have crazy hair, um, and it just doesn't do well if you don't do something to it. Well, I have burned my hair in Greece before when I tried to use a U.S. straightener, like with the converter. So when I got to Vienna, I did go somewhere and buy a European straightener. So like I had that with me. Hmm. And now okay. I have it. And I would buy... For your computer instead of using a converter i would be by the european you know if you if you have a mac you can order the chargers from like all the countries where it's actually the whole charger that's european um i just think with your computers and phones and stuff it's too tricky i mean my phone was fine with the converter yeah i've traveled in europe before and i didn't have a converter and i ruined some electronics behind that yeah. so yeah oh. lesson learned the hard way yeah you yeah. have to be smart about it definitely so while you were traveling did you have the opportunity to stop at any wineries no I didn't do that I mean I just kind of enjoyed it as part of my everyday life I will tell you the best wine I had, in my opinion, was this little, it was, um, it's the Gothic quarter in Barcelona was my favorite. That's where Emma and I went out that night. And, um, we tried to go to one tapas bar that was highly rated, but you know, they were full. So we walked down the street to another and it was so cute. It was like, you just stood at this counter, um, I'll find pictures. And that's where we met the, the British couple. They had been, it was so funny. They have small kids too, Sarah, and they own a property that they rent in Spain. Mm. So every few months they have someone keep the kids and they go to Spain and they just drink their faces off for two days. So we met them at night and they had been drinking all day. So they were quite hilarious, but like super sweet and nice. Um, so anyway, we're at this tapas bar. 
Um, and, and it was funny. I'm going to call Emma out because she was hesitant to try stuff because, you know, the fried sardines were the big thing there. I mean, they were so exceptionally good at this tapas bar. We're just standing at the counter and then they would give you like these tiny glasses of wine and it was this huge vat and they would pour it from the tap and hold it down here. And that wine was so darn good. Like you didn't even have a choice. They had a rosé, a white and a red, and you basically got house wine. It was so good. I love that place. And the guy helping us, I would say is probably in his seventies. He said he had worked there since he was 16. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I'm remembering I had to go to Barcelona a couple times for work a few years ago. And in the Gothic quarter, we found this incredible bar that was meant to look like an outdoor forest of fairies. I think it was called fairy, but it was spelled in Spanish fairy. And yeah. it inside it had moss covered trees and it kind of smelled like dingy, but in a foresty way. I don't know. It oh was such a fun experience. Um, so I've been to the Gothic quarter. That's a great place. Yeah, I loved it. My hotel was right on the water. I wanted as much water view as I could, because um, that's the one thing for me being in Nashville. I mean, in Houston, we were landlocked too, but closer to the Gulf, right? Like, I really love being on the water. So I tried to optimize water views as much as I could when I was there. Um, so I loved it. I, I didn't have enough time in Barcelona, but I of what I saw, the Gothic Quarter was my favorite. Like, I just thought it was kind of fun to walk through. But I mean, I, I remember being there on Sunday and it also felt very touristy. So I think I'd like to go back and find an area that was maybe more authentic. Of the places that you traveled in Europe, where would you recommend? Because I've, I've not done extensive European travel, but where would you recommend? Like a bucket list for me. Uh, well, if it's someone's first time, I think London, Paris is your first foray into Europe. What do you think, Sarah? Oh, gosh. I mean, that's a, I, that is a good idea. But for me, if, it's, if easy. You, it's easy, but I think a more European way to, uh, it mm -hmm. would be go in at Italy. I yeah. think you were right to do Italy and Spain. London and Paris are so internationalized now i hate it's to true say that. and you, vienna you, was yeah. very international yeah and i think if you want strictly europe um i think trying to drop yourself head first into europe by way of italy and maybe the border towns where italy meets switzerland would be mm -hmm. a fun way to go about it and plan on taking a lot of trains yeah, definitely trains to see the scenery. And, you know, it also depends on what kind of Europe you want. Like Europe's so diverse because Italy, Spain, Greece is more like Mediterranean, right? Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, I would love to go to like Denmark. I mean, that's a whole different world. I haven't been there yet. Um, and I'm a huge fan of Germany. I don't think I could live in Germany, but Germany is so naturally beautiful. Like, and it's just different. It's, it, it's interesting to see. So I don't know. I don't think you can go wrong. Another incredibly beautiful European city is Prague, which actually Sarah and I have been to Prague together. Mm -hmm. um, and I had been there before. Yeah. Like Prague is, Prague is very like beautiful. I feel it's very untouched by the war, which unfortunately you have to pay attention to because a lot of cities, you know, were um, hurt during the war. Um, and actually in Italy, my favorite town is Verona. So I don't know if you've ever been there, Sarah, but it's in between Milan and Venice. So I definitely in Italy recommend flying into Milan because it's the easiest airport, even if you don't hang in Milan, like you can go up to Como. I mean, I love Milan, but I live there, but it's like the New York City of Italy, right? So it's mm -hmm. not like necessarily the Italian feel. Like Sarah said, it's a lot more international, like mm -hmm. cosmopolitan. Um, but you can go to Lake Como, but a lot of people go from Milan straight to Venice and Verona's right there in the middle. I would for sure stay a night or two in Verona. Yeah. For most unique experiences, to echo April, I would say Prague and Venice. I haven't been to Verona, mm -hmm. but I sure would go if I was going to go back to Venice today. But those destinations have maintained their uniqueness about them. Yeah. Whereas we live in such a global world now, it's a little 
bit homogenized at this point. Yeah, and I still think Florence is really nice to see, but do not go in the middle of tourist season. Like, even when Sarah and I were in Prague, remember we were there for the week? It was a trip I had, and my parents were there, too. And, like, it was, like, I think we landed Monday, and Monday through Wednesday was fine. And Thursday, it's like all the tourists showed up for the weekend. And Mm -hmm. suddenly we're like, we're not going anywhere. (laughs) Like, we're just going to find – actually, we went hiking out of the city the last day because we're like, we're getting out of here. So, um, you know, Florence, you have to be real careful. Try to go when there aren't as many tourists because it's so overrun with tourists. I still think September and, like, March, April are the best times to go. I mean, April, you're going to get a little bit warmer weather. That's why Mm -hmm. I say April. But if you can go while kids are still in school, it's going to be a little better. I have kind of a funny travel story from when I was in college. Um, My dad had made arrangements for me and a roommate. We were studying abroad in England, and we were going to go to Anna Capri outside of Capri, and we were going to stay at his friend's house. And this was such a great opportunity because obviously being in college, we did not have a lot of money. So we just had to get ourselves on a plane from Manchester to... um, you fly into Naples in this case, yeah. and then you take a you take a ferry. Well, literally the day before, my friend Leslie and I were going to arrive. Uh, my dad got a message that they were doing some kind of construction in the house, and they couldn't host us. So my dad, being a good dad, scrambled, and he found another place for Leslie and I to stay. And my dad, I remember telling him telling me about it. I think we were on a payphone even, and he was saying that they have a beautiful pool, they have breakfast every day, they pick you up from the ferry in a red convertible. The website made it look absolutely amazing so leslie and i make it down there we stop in this famous pizza place in naples we take the pizza we get on the ferry we get to capri we get off in capri and there's no beautiful red convertible to pick us up and whisk us up the hill to go to our airbnb so we get to a payphone and we call them and we we're told um oh no that's seasonal we don't have that. You guys are going to have to come up um, on the public bus, which is no problem. We're not adverse to public buses, but here, herein lies the problem. Um, the public bus dropped, dropped off at the foot of the hill, and we had to do switchbacks mm-hmm. with our luggage all the way up to the destination. The next surprise was the pool. That also was seasonal. So there, <laughs> there was no pool, and um, which was okay. We ended up swimming in the Mediterranean um, because yeah. we could walk down and access it. But it was really fun. So um, that's just kind of like an adventure to share, just keeping an open mind. Oh, my gosh. Actually, so my last night in Vienna... Um, my friend and I were invited to someone's house just outside of Vienna, right? So we got there, you know, we, we took an, I think we took an Uber out there. I don't remember. So in Vienna, Ubers are great. They're easy, but this was a suburb. So I think we took an Uber out there and we went early because there was a really beautiful church in this town and some other things to see. So we went to like walk around the town and visit. And then the reason I remembered the the woman who invited us to dinner didn't realize that her house was like on top of the hill where we were so very much the same and we kept trying to get an uber getting a taxi like you know it's getting closer and closer to dinner time because we realized we had to walk up this hill and i basically had like you know vegan leather pants on like this was a night that I was not dressed to be walking I did have my comfortable and so finally we realized we weren't getting anything and we had to just walk up and it was like 20 minutes of just like this so it was kind of crazy so these things happen you find yourself in places where you're kind of stranded and you Mm -hmm. just have to like suck it up and walk and i was like great i'm gonna be pouring sweat at dinner but you know it's just like <laughs> and then they finally called asking where we were and we were like five minutes from the house and they're like oh we'll come get you and i'm like well at this point i just you know me i like to finish things i'm like at this point they don't need to get us we have like five more minutes mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh yeah the, these things happen even in your adult life you get stranded in places <laughs> where you have to get somewhere Cool. Awesome. All right. Let's take one more question um, and then we will roll off if you have one. Which European city had the friendliest locals? Mm. 
from this trip or my experience period? Mm, your experience period. <laughs> I actually felt, oh, in Greece, when I was in Crete, like everyone was so nice. Like even, you know, there are the guys that stand outside the restaurants trying to get you to come in and eat. And every day from our hotel, we'd walk into town and like, of course, there and we never went in to eat because we had things planned. And still every day, like they got to know our names. They'd say hi, like mm. everybody, like I love Crete. Everyone was so super friendly. So it's not a huge city, um, but yeah, I love that island. I thought everybody was incredibly kind and friendly. Now Crete is on my bucket list. They have some caverns mm. there that I want to visit. Mm. I'll go with you. I'll go back to Crete anytime. I love that place. I think the friendliest place in Europe that I have visited was Scotland. Yeah. And specifically the northern western part of Scotland near Isle of Skye. And I remember I was on a tour there um, and a long time ago. Uh, and everybody was so nice. And I had some postcards to mail. And I went into a grocery store to mail them. And the woman was like, oh, no, I'll stamp them and mail them for you. It was just so sweet among among the many things that happened on that trip. It was just so nice. Actually, when I was in Northern Ireland, I had that same experience. Everyone was very kind because, you know, me, we're staying like outside of town in some, you know, castle or something. It was an event. And of course, I Uber into town to get a blowout because I hate doing my hair. So I'm just like in a small town in Northern Ireland at the salon, which is really interesting. You always meet people and the women were just so kind and so fascinated with like where I came from and why I was getting my <laughs> hair done there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I love I loved Northern Ireland. It was beautiful. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's it. Um, thanks so much for participating. It was fun to be interviewed. I liked it a lot. Awesome. Thank thanks you for, for allowing us. us. Yes. Cool. Well, have a great day. And everyone, um, if you're listening to this, I said it at the beginning, or if you see a little snippet on social, this full episode is on YouTube. We do run all of my solo episodes and our panel discussions in YouTube. I think it's a little bit more fun sometimes when you can see us. Um, anyway, I hope that you all have a wonderful day. I hope that while we were talking, you thought about your bucket list dream trip. And here's your challenge put it on the calendar now. I had plenty of reasons not to go to Europe for th these three weeks and I made it work. I was incredibly productive. I had a great life and it really refreshed my spirit. So I challenge you, do something to get yourself out of your norm, get yourself and your family out of your norm. I know that sometimes we feel like we're in the grind. Get away by yourself, get away with those you love and really just enjoy it and you come back with a whole new attitude. So again, Sarah and Shelly, thank you so much. Have a fantastic day and we'll talk to you soon. Adios. Adios. <laughs>